Hi, it's Ashley from Sweet Dreams Bake Shop, and welcome back to my channel where I make a lot of cake and cookie decorating tutorials, as well as give a lot of baking business tips. And as per usual, please stay till the end of the video so I can share my pricing guide with you. So firstly, we're going to start off with those bagel and donut macarons. Now, in order to get that brown color, all I'm doing is I'm adding just a little hint of yellow directly to those egg whites. You can add it at the meringue stage as well. And then I'm adding a little bit of cocoa powder. Now, I am using the Italian meringue method for these macarons. Now you can use whatever macaron method that you desire, but I have some recommendations for some really great recipes here on YouTube that you can follow. If you are new to my channel, then welcome. My channel generally focuses on the decorating portion of desserts, so that's mainly what I'm going to be showing you in today's tutorial. Now this is the part of macaron making that usually gets most of us and is usually the reason why macarons fail. I know I couldn't get this part right for the longest time, but my general rule of thumb is to first fold all of those dry ingredients with that meringue. Once everything is fully combined, it's going to be pretty fluffy still, so then you want to start beating out that meringue bubble. And what I mean by that is you want to get that a little bit looser. You don't want it to be too loose because if it's soupy it's really not going to hold its shape you're not going to get feet at all but you do want it to be more of a thick batter honey like consistency now when i'm doing shaped macarons like this you'll notice that the batter actually isn't flowing into itself you can see where it starts and it ends that's because I like to have a little bit more control. I find that if I don't have this type of control, then things start kind of melding together and you might not get the desired shape. So notice here, how do I get rid of that start and end? I really bang out the pans until I get that nice end flat. I let mine rest for about an hour and a little bit more, but if you don't want to use a rest recipe, by all means use a no rest recipe. I will also leave one down in the description box below. It's a great one. I do find that the shells end up slightly drier, but if you're not picky about that, then definitely go with that one to save on time. I'm using strawberry buttercream to fill these macarons. If you want to know the recipe for that, you can go ahead and check out my video in the right hand corner. Now originally I did start off using that French tip, kind of swooping it forward towards the center, but I found that actually isn't the best way to pipe it. It's much better to just star tip it like this. Even though I think it looks prettier the other way when it's left open, once you put the top on, you really don't notice a difference, so it's much better to do it that way. Now some of these are going to turn into bagels, and some of these are going to be donuts. So the ones that I actually star tipped, those are going to be donuts, and these ones here are going to be my bagels that are supposed to be filled with strawberry cream cheese. Now I did forget a step, and I really should have done this because it really would have made a really great differentiation between the donuts and the bagels, but I should have added on a few sesame seeds on on top of the bagel ones before they baked and before that skin formed on top of the macarons. That would really have set it apart. And I also did a little bit of airbrushing and petal dusting with these afterward, but in my haste, I forgot to grab a shot of those, so my apologies. Now moving along to the donuts, what I did was I actually put these in the freezer for a little bit just to get them nice and solidified so when I did this dipping portion into the chocolate, nothing would fall apart on me. Now you can use colored white chocolate or you can use candy melts, whatever you desire. Just make sure that you add in a little bit of flavorless oil to your chocolate so that it stays relatively flat. Now when I pulled the donut up, or sorry, the macaron up from the chocolate, then there was a little bit of a lip that formed in the center. I could have shook it so that it would stay nice and flat. I just left it because I knew I was going to drizzle it with more colored white chocolate. And then I'm going ahead and I'm adding some sprinkles. I just really wanted to make sure that I sold the idea that these were supposed to be donuts, so I felt like the drizzle and the sprinkles were the way to go. Now, if you're making these in advance and you want to be able to freeze them, I suggest that you freeze them without the chocolate topping on them. I sometimes find that if you do try to freeze it with the chocolate on there, when they come back out of the freezer, things start to expand and crack. So we really don't want to damage any of these beautiful macarons. Moving along to the next item in our treat box, we're going to make a bunch of sugar cookies. And if you want my classic sugar cookie recipe, go ahead and check out that video in the right hand corner. I notice a lot of people struggle with maintaining the shape of their sugar cookies, and this happens for a few reasons. Sometimes this can happen because your dough is not cold enough. I generally like to chill it for about 30 minutes or so in the fridge, or you don't put enough flour underneath so things stick too much and then it's really hard to maintain that shape, especially when you're lifting off something like a rectangle shape. After this step, it is really important just to stick it back in the fridge, especially if you're making a shape that's a little bit more perfect like a rectangle, so that it solidifies back up and then when you put it in the oven, it should bake up really nicely. 
After you get all of your cookies baked, it is time to ice. And we're just using a pipe and flood consistency the whole time for all of these cookies. If you wanna know what pipe and flood consistency is, then go ahead and check out this video in the right hand corner where I go a little bit more in depth about the entire process. It was really fun to cut out the shape of these eggs because honestly, you could just do whatever. And I made sure to use a very, very sharp X-Acto knife whenever you're hand cutting dough or else things are going to grab onto each other and you're just not going to get a nice clean cut. Now for one of these cookies, I did have to use a bench scraper when it came out of the oven to give it a cleaner cut because what happened was I did not refrigerate these for long enough. Again, in my haste, did not do so, so I had to cut off the edges. Now I prefer a cookie edge that is not cut, but in a desperate pinch, if you need to do that, feel free to cut off whatever when it comes directly out of the oven and it's still warm. It won't work once it's cooled because then you won't be able to cut through it as nicely. And by the way, for this toast color, I just used a hint of fawn dust in the brown color to get that. But just a little bit of brown and a little bit of yellow will get you that color. For this Pop-Tart color here, I used, again, the same thing, but a little bit more yellow than brown. So I would say about two drops of yellow and one drop of brown. Now you can use Chef Master Food Coloring, which is what I used, or AmeriColor will work great as well. Now I am placing these cookies into the oven at 175 degrees Fahrenheit just to get that nice and opaque on the top so that I can add layers like this yolk. And when you're using the correct pipe and flood consistency, you won't get any overflow with this. Now I'm going to add a little pepper, but it's not really pepper. It's actually black sesame powder, which is kind of flavorless, especially in this tiny, tiny amount. And finally, moving on to our jelly toasts, again, using some purple here. Now, my purple did come out a little blue. If you find that your tone is too blue for you, go ahead and add a little bit of pink to it. It'll really warm up the tones of this jam here. You can also do this with white chocolate as well if you prefer. I just like making sure that all of my sugar cookies are done with royal icing for the most part. Now I haven't eaten Pop-Tarts in a really long time, but from what I remember, real Pop-Tarts actually have the icing almost falling off the sides. But I just wanted to make this a little cuter, a little bit more perfect, so we're keeping all of that frosting on top in the center. And then go ahead and add on some sprinkles. Now, the colors that I'm looking at here really aren't the colors of a Pop-Tart that I know of. So if you want to be a little bit more particular, definitely go ahead and look at some pictures of Pop-Tarts and copy them to a T. Now my airbrush machine it has pretty much had it. It is literally falling apart in my hands. I'm getting a new one very, very soon, but I'm still waiting on it. So in the meantime, I'm going to use some brown petal dust instead just to give that a little bit of a more toasty edge. I was trying to give this treat box an array of colors and I think it looks pretty good, but you could definitely switch up those toast toppings to give it more colors as well. Moving along to the final item. Now, originally I was going to do sausage cake pops, but I thought it might look slightly strange if I didn't pull it off to a T. So I decided to go with something a little bit more safe. I decided to go for a giant orange cake pop. Now, I, I'm a little hard pressed to call this a cake pop cake pop because it's not going to be covered in chocolate. This is actually a little bit of frosting on there, so I, I don't really know what to call this. I'm just gonna call it a mini orange cake. And this is one of those things that came together relatively quickly. Now I'm using fondant because that's what I have on hand. I think it might be a little better with modeling chocolate though. Now you'll notice I did use an orange to imprint that texture onto this orange fondant, but it didn't quite do the trick as much as I would have liked it to. I think using a navel orange, which has a little bit more of a firmer skin and a little bit deeper of indentations, might have been better for this particular project. But it did give me those smaller details that my cake tool can't necessarily do. So I did poke around there just to give it a few deeper indentations. And now you'll notice here I'm creating the top. And the top portion I was actually really happy with the way that this turned out. Don't be afraid to indent. Even if you puncture it just a little bit, it's going to be just fine here because you're going to place this little green part on top. And it's always great when you're trying to do something a little bit more realistic to have the object right in front of you. It's great practice and eventually you'll probably be able to make one without even looking at anything else. I used a bit of a deeper green color here, just added a hint more food coloring. I'm putting this little round piece on top because that kind of looks like the stem portion that got cut off there. 
And then I'm going to go ahead and add a few more indents. I'll often do this. I'll keep indenting or keep texturing something. And then I'm going to add a little bit of airbrush before I add the final details to that top portion. You'll notice I'm adding in just hints of green. I was looking at the orange in front of me, the real one, and I noticed that it had a few green spots on there. So I decided to go ahead and airbrush a little bit of green on here as well. And then I'm going to go ahead and airbrush that with a little bit more orange. Now I do like the shiny quality. I feel Feel like it really gives it that realistic vibe but I think if I wanted it to remain shiny then I should have added a little bit of corn syrup to the outside. Now I missed the clip of myself doing this but I painted the top with a little bit of white paint just so it gets a little bit more pale on the top. And here is the little orange. Now I do want to start getting more into hyper realistic cakes. This isn't quite hyper realistic. I would say it's more on the realistic side, but it's more keeping in tone with our treat box. So let's get into the pricing. Now I didn't do any fancy packaging. I have really been overwhelmed guys. So I'm just going to give you the individualized pricing guide that I would use for each item. Now I don't think I would sell these things separately, especially because they're all themed together. But based on what you see I would charge for each item, you can kind of think about how you would combine these items and what different levels of treat boxes you might make. And I will say that the magic of treat boxes really does rely on that packaging. So don't follow what I did. <laughs> Do something that's going to be fun and attractive for your customers, and I highly recommend pre-orders. Now let's get into the subscriber submission of the video. I just love how smooth and dreamy this whole cake is. Be sure to go and check them out, drop them a like, and drop them a comment. And if you want to be the next featured subscriber submission of the video, then please follow me at SD Bake Shop on Instagram, where you can either tag me in a photo or send me a photo. Any and all dessert levels are welcome. Thanks so much for watching, guys. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe so you can be part of the Sweetie Fam. Right now, I'm uploading weekly, so make sure you hit that notification bell so you know when I upload. Also, be sure to comment, request, or ask a question. I love hearing from you guys. Bye.